Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of 1968. As we near the end of this course, there's just one more topic to discuss, one of the most well-remembered and fondest remembered of all of the aspects of 1968, the music of that year. So I'll spend these last couple of lectures talking about some of the music, but I encourage you, if you haven't already, to go out and listen to some of this music because there's no way to replicate it simply by talking about it. In this first lecture, I'll talk a little bit about the previous year and the legacies of the music of 1967. Like everything else in 1968, the music on the airwaves had its origins in the months and years before 1968 itself. Bands, albums, and songs that were popular in 1967 and earlier in the decade were still very much in play in 1968, but there were also a host of new groups and new developments that I'll talk about. Many of the artists at the top of the playlist in 1968 released albums and songs in 1967, and the music of that year had a profound impact in 1968. One important touchstone event of 1967 was the Monterey Pop Festival, held at the Monterey County Fairgrounds from June 16th to 18th. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, San Francisco was the epicenter of the hippie subculture, and 1967 in San Francisco was known as the Summer of Love. The Monterey Pop Festival was a big part of that legacy. The three-day festival featured a who's who of bands from all over the world, many already well-established and many others on the rise. It marked the U.S. debut performance of important rock icons, Jimi Hendrix and The Who. It was also the first major appearance for Janis Joplin and her band, Big Brother and the Holding Company, and Otis Redding, who died just a few weeks later. One writer described it this way, Monterey Pop was a seminal event. It was the first real rock festival ever held, featuring debut performances of bands that would shape the history of rock and affect popular culture from that day forward. Monterey Pop established a blueprint for large outdoor rock festivals, most notably Woodstock, which was held two years later. It also built on the tradition of other musical festivals in different genres, such as Jazz Fest in New Orleans and the Newport Jazz Festival and Folk Festival. Monterey was a much larger and louder festival than those typically were. Somewhere between 50 and 90,000 were in attendance around the clock over the three days, with more than 200,000 total attending. But it was a completely peaceful and safe event, with no deaths, no injuries, no violence, and no arrests. Monterey also set a new standard for a multicultural and multi-genre musical festival with an emphasis on rock and roll, but some artists performing folk, blues, jazz, R&B, and classical and strings music. Among the headlining acts were established artists, the Mamas and the Papas, Simon and Garfunkel, and the Birds, but it's better known for launching the careers of many budding stars. As mentioned, British stars Jimi Hendrix and The Who made their American debuts, instantly securing themselves star status in the States. Hendrix famously lit his guitar on fire at the end of his performance, to the delight of the crowd. Janis Joplin also secured her reputation as a bona fide star with a memorable performance. She remained one of the biggest stars in rock for the next several years. Monterey also broke down not only racial and gender barriers, with many performances featuring both black and white artists and men and women, but also regional barriers as well. The bill was filled not only with California artists, but also others from farther away, in Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, and Memphis, among many others. Many of these bands, along with the international groups, met personally for the first time in Monterey forging personal and professional relationships that would impact the rock landscape for decades. Monterey also showcased a new generation of British artists, signaling another step in the so-called British invasion. 
Well-established bands, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, did not perform, although Paul McCartney was part of the organizational board. The Beatles had actually retired from touring, and the Rolling Stones were in the midst of battling drug charges that prevented them from touring for the next two years. It was the Who who starred at Monterey, announcing their presence as the next great British band. By 1967 as well, the American music scene was thoroughly awash in British influence. The so-called British invasion had been underway since the Beatles began to top the charts as early as 1962. American music was deeply influential in Britain in the early 1960s, especially the music of African-American guitarists and singers like Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Little Richard, and Ray Charles, among many others. Artists like Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Buddy Holly, and Roy Orbison were also very popular in Britain, especially with the youth. Teenagers in Britain began teaching themselves to play guitar like those American artists, adding their own angsty twists, especially in working-class cities like Liverpool, home of the Beatles. The rebellious music caught on. It was the Beatles, of course, who launched the British invasion. While their songs had been popular in the U.S. for months, their arrival in New York on February 7, 1964, and then their historic performance on The Ed Sullivan Show on February 9th, reverberated across the pop culture landscape. As the crowd screamed their approval, dozens of other British artists set their sights on making their name in America. The success of the Beatles sparked a wave of new bands in Britain, many of whom soon made a mark in the States. Naming just a few, they included The Kinks, The Rolling Stones, The Yardbirds, The Who, Dusty Springfield, The Dave Clark Five, The Hollies, The Monkees, The Animals, The Moody Blues, and many others. By 1967, many of those bands were churning out hits and touring in the States, and their music was played widely in 1968. I should also note the release of one of the greatest albums of all time, the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, widely regarded as the best record ever made, which was released in 1967. Its songs were all over the radio in 1968, and I'll talk more about it in a future lecture. Another musical legacy of 1967 was Alice's Restaurant, a quirky song of some 18 minutes by Arlo Guthrie, who talks and sings his way through a long, winding story about a Thanksgiving Day incident of several years earlier. The song was released in 1967, but played everywhere in 1968. And again, I'll talk more about it in the next lecture. Finally, I should mention the arrival of another new band, The Doors, which released its debut album in January 1967. The opening song on that record self-titled as The Doors, was Break On Through, a screaming, smashing rock anthem that announced The Doors as a musical force. The album included hits like Light My Fire and Backdoor Man. They released another album in 1967, Strange Days, which included another hit, the title track. Building on this success, they released one of the most highly anticipated albums of 1968, Waiting for the Sun, which included their biggest hit to date, Hello, I Love You. Well, I could easily spend an entire lecture just on the many great artists, albums, and songs of 1967. For now, we'll leave this as an introduction, and in the next lecture, we'll move on to the music of 1968 itself.